Tom Dawkins is one of Australia's leading social enterprise advocates and teachers, a regular speaker at leading global events and a LinkedIn top voice for social change. Tom is the co-founder and CEO of Start Some Good, a social enterprise that helps people design, launch and grow social impact projects, and the co-founder of Lend for Good, a new crowd lending platform for impact enterprises. Start Some Good provides fundraising and community infrastructure for social entrepreneurs and designs and delivers impact accelerators and capacity building programs for partners, including Optus, ING, the United Nations Development Program and the City of Sydney. First of all, let me just acknowledge that I'm hosting this call from the traditional lands of the Kamaragal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to, to meet with all of you. Um, acknowledging, of course, that first the wisdom of our First Nations people, I think, is a big part of the solutions that we need to the challenge of achieving the sustainable development goals. Social enterprises, I think, are also a big part of uh, how of the solutions to how we can achieve the sustainable development goals. And so what I want to cover tonight in quite a rapid fire format is an overview of what are social enterprises and kind of what's going on in the ecosystem broadly, why we're seeing such strong growth in the social enterprise sector today and why they matter uh, in terms of the innovation and impact that we need. So first of all, what? That sounds like a simple question to answer, but it's actually something that is a common source of confusion to people by what even exactly do we mean by social enterprise. Depending on where you are in the world and who you ask, a range of different things might be proffered as examples of social enterprises from charities with a on-mission trading contract through to a for-profit business, but which redistributes some of its profits towards socially good through to various flavors of social purpose or socially responsible business, circular economy models and more. If you ask, you know, and again, it depends somewhat where you are. If you're in the US, they primarily mean the term to mean profit for purpose. If you're in the UK, they primarily mean a charity, but which trades and in Australia, uh, we kind of debate between those two points of view. Ultimately, I say yes to all of those. That social enterprise is really kind of a broader concept than any of those one examples. Those are all examples of social enterprise forms because social enterprise ultimately is doing two things that used to be bifurcated together. This is the world's most simple graph. I made this myself. This is my graphic design is my passion. Um, the graph for you all, we used to consider that the domain of private benefit was entirely the world of kind of traditional business. And then when it came to focusing on communal benefits, that was the world of nonprofits and community organizations. And people tended to bifurcate between these. And what social enterprise is simply proposing is what if we could do those together? What if there were ways of satisfying both the private benefits required of staff or entrepreneurs or customers while simultaneously ensuring the communal benefits in the form of a more sustainable environment, more sustainable communities, uh, more shared opportunities, and so on. And so at the end of the day, those are the two must-haves to be a social enterprise, is you must have a clear social or environmental impact model, and you must be an you must be trading, you must be a business. So you're combining those two things, a business model with an impact model. Here's the definition used by SECNA, the Social Enterprise Council of New South Wales and the ACT. Uh, they say they have three things, which I, you know, I think my two summarize these, but they say social environment, cultural or environmental purpose, generate a substantial portion of their income from trade and invest profits or resources into their purpose so that public community benefit outweighs private benefit. Sometimes that's about balancing between those. Sometimes those are highly aligned, whereby the product is driving the impact and therefore as you reinvest in the product or the distribution of the product, you are simultaneously growing your impact. So the interesting question to me is not, so to be clear, just to, to really, really summarize this, it's not about legal form. There is, again, in some parts of the world, there are social enterprise legal structures. There isn't one in Australia. Even where there is a, a social enterprise legal structure, it doesn't begin to capture the diversity of social enterprises. There are social enterprises that are for-profits. There are social enterprises that are non-profits. There are social enterprises that are cooperatives. The legal structure doesn't matter. It's a doing. Are they doing these two things or three things, depending on whose list you prefer? And if they're doing those, these two things, clear impact model, clear business model, we would call them a social enterprise. And so I think what's interesting then is to say, how do those pieces come together? How does a business model drive an impact model? Um, and so it starts some good. Our work is all about inspiring and supporting early stage on, uh, social entrepreneurs to design impact businesses and then to rally the resources they need to get them off the ground through our crowdfunding platforms. We've worked with literally thousands of, of social enterprises. 
we have a, our own kind of taxonomy of six core impact models that social enterprises use. And they fit into two main genres, which we call redistributive versus embedded impact. And you can think of these being above and below profits. Redistributive impact are in some ways more traditional businesses. They, they run a business, they aim for a surplus, and then they leverage that surplus to do good. And they do that in one of two ways, normally through the direct redistribution of profits or through the redistribution of goods either through a buy one, give one model or a cross subsidy model. Um, say we do a certain amount of commercial legal work and that allows us to do a, a, another big chunk of pro bono or, for, or low bono legal work for a group who otherwise wouldn't have access to that. Or embedded impact, that's where the impact is delivered, embedded within the business model. That in some ways, even if the business was never made a profit, ran at break even, it would still be making enormous impact it doesn't rely on profits to make impacts, the, the impacts are created through the course of the business activities. And there tend to be, we think there's kind of four main ways that happens. Employment is one of the best understood. The business is designed to create employment opportunities for people otherwise excluded. So you see that with people with uh, social enterprises who employ refugees, the long-term unemployed, former convicts, and so on. Um, those with um, physical um, disabilities, etc. Access, that's often about, so that's redesigning who does the work in a way that makes it, that, that, that supports, you know, social progress and, and equality. Access is often about redesigning the business model or the delivery model to give people access to something they need that have been historically been excluded for. You know, an example of that is banking services delivered through mobile phone networks in Africa. Hundreds of millions in Africa alone it were unbanked. I did not have access to that, but that was rethought in terms of the delivery model of that using mobile phone networks to create bank-like infrastructure for the base of the pyramid. Better for us is often around health and wellness products that through the consumption of that product, we are actually healthier in some ways, often around mental health or physical health. And then better for the world is usually, but not always about inputs. So think circular economy models using recycled or recovered materials or you know clean energy instead of dirty energy. What are the inputs of that energy? The sun rather than coal. Um, so better for the world is often about what is it made out of, um, although not always. And then there are blended, of course. You see social enterprises that are doing a whole bunch of these things all together. Some do that very successfully. That can also be a common kind of trap for new players is, you know, very passionate, well-meaning people trying to do all the good they can do, but setting the bar very high for themselves in the early stages of launch launching a social enterprise by giving away all their profits and giving away you know, a product for everyone they sell and employing people with high needs and using only the most sustainable possible materials. That's a fantastic place to end up, but it can be a challenging place to begin. Often what we encourage people is to really hone in on one core impact model, just as we would say the same on the business model side, hone in on, on you know, one core product or service with one core target market to begin with, get that foothold, and then you can expand from there. And we think it's, you know, usually advisable to do the same on the impact side, although of course there are exceptions and entrepreneurs, you know, much cleverer than me, uh, who, who can who can achieve those diverse outcomes. So to give some examples, um, probably in terms of the redistribution of goods, Tom's was probably the one that made this famous in terms of their one for one shoe model in, in Australia. And an example of that is Hero Condoms, who sell condoms in Australia and then give them away in Sub-Saharan Africa. Probably the most high profile redistribution of profit enterprise in Australia is Thank You. This is a bit of an unfair photo, to be honest, because they're out of the water business, which I am thrilled about, because in some ways they also show some of the trade-offs or, or some of the, the blind spots that can occur when pursuing a single impact model that you also need to be aware of, which is sometimes you forget that it matters how you make the money as well, not just what you do with the money. And I always felt fairly uncomfortable that one of the, that Australia's most high-profile social enterprise was in the business of selling single-use plastic. I'm thrilled that they're not anymore and that they're focused on homewares and soaps and so on, which I'm happy user of also some also too much single use plastic in there to be honest but um but they're making progress there are lots of other examples of this in australia and most western countries in, in terms of different um you know product segments we've also worked with the a good beer company who apply that model to beer and, and many many other examples as well to be honest those are in the often in consumer products but not always this is an example of one in the in the you know in the in the b2b services space this was actually a commercial law firm but which then are owned by and um, by the Salvation Army, which all, all of whose profits went to supporting the Salvation Army. 
Now, sometimes people talk about their impact model in a way that doesn't entirely line up with which it is. For instance, Street is a well-known um, kind of cafe catering, coffee roasting social enterprise in Melbourne. And as it says here on their chalkboard, 100% of profit stops homelessness, which certainly sounds like a redistributive, you know, a redistributive model that we run cafes and we redistribute the profit to, you know, nonprofits to to do the work. In fact, they're uh, largely an employment, an embedded employment model. Um, but the shorthand, but that 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 takes quite a lot more words to explain. Um, and so the shorthand for that is we use all our resources to stop homelessness. The way they actually do that is not by giving away the profits. They are in fact not profitable. Um, it, it is in fact very difficult to run work integrated social enterprises profitably because of the additional costs that are required to really support a high needs person into employment. Um, so they often they're often hybrid organisations that require hybrid support. You know, still still earning the majority of their income from trade, but often requiring and deserving of, because it's a, often a very efficient model, you know, requiring some philanthropic subsidy. But, you know, philanthropy in the case of street covers 30 percent, pays for 30 percent of their uh, their turnover and budget and work and impact rather than having to pay for 100 um, percent. And of course, the whole point is to generate the jobs. And to do that, you need to be running a business. Um which they do very successfully, and they're a great example. And what I love personally about these embedded models is in some ways that's, I think, the true rethinking of the role of business. I think, you know, the higher calling of or, or mission around social enterprise, I think, is not just better enterprises, but a better form of capitalism, which, cent which centers social and environmental outcomes in the way that we do business and which increases the expectation that businesses do focus on delivering social or considering social and environmental outcomes. And so while often the high... There are a lot of very high profile redistributive social enterprises. And again, even non redistributed often use the language of redistributive because, in some ways, it's the easiest people to understand. Oh, you give your profits away. That's, that's a lovely thing to do. That's wonderful. And it is a wonderful thing to do. And if anyone's working on that model, full respect for that. That's awesome too. But to some extent, I think that doesn't rethink that role of business, that role of capitalism. In some ways, that's how philanthropy has always worked. Someone ran a business, made a surplus, and then gave it away. With social enterprise, it's great that that's locked into the model and there's transparency and commitment around that rather than relying, you know, rather than hoping that the person who made all the money does the right thing down the track and so on. But really, it's the embedded models, I think, that are thinking kind of more deeply around what is the role of business, you know, because so, the role, of, if if, you're, if all your income is made, impact is made through redistributing your profits, you kind of get left focusing in the same place that traditional business focuses, which is maximizing your profits. How do you do more good? You, you have to make more profits. That, and that's always been what we considered the role of business. Businesses make profit, and then who do they give that money to if they want to do social good? Nonprofits, because it's their job to deal with the tough issues of social change. But I think it's very inspiring when people are pursuing these new models and saying, actually, it can be the role of business to really tackle it at source as well, to really work with um, these vulnerable young people and to create the kinds of workplaces that create that opportunity for them as well. Um, anyway, I need to keep moving. This is a very successful example of a blended model. It's an e-waste recycling facility in Queensland called Substation 33. It has a parent charity um, that it redistributes its profit to. It's better for the world because it's recovering those resources and allowing them to be reused, that circular economy model, and it creates employment outcomes um, for disadvantaged communities. This is an example of an access social enterprise. This created a low-cost speech therapy um, opportunity um, experience through a mobile app, um, particularly in America where a lot of people didn't have you know, good health insurance so, um, that necessarily covered the very expensive process of having speech therapy, specifically for people who had a severe stutter. Um, this is uh, Oceans and Bikinis. All of their swimwear is made out of plastics recovered from the ocean. So again, better for the world. Certainly there's nothing that is any better for you wearing their swimwear rather than anyone else's, but you know it does pull plastics out of the ocean. So that's a circular economy model as well. Um, now, because there's no one definition in a way, no one, you can't just look up. You can always just look up the number of charities, the number of businesses. You can't just look up the number of social enterprises um, because they aren't any one legal structure. But using a much more a much tighter definition than the one that I've used, that, that is much that's much more specific around kind of thresholds of impact um, to meet the social traders who are one of the certifying or the, the one of the lead certifying organizations in Australia. It's their job to maintain a very, you know, kind of specific line around what is and isn't. As starts from good, we see it more around getting people on the journey and on the trajectory, more of a broad concept. But using their more specific definition, they came up with these figures last year, 12,000 social enterprises in Australia, $21 billion uh, economically, 1% of the GDP and 1.6% of the workforce, the same as the mining sector. And then there's a broader kind of 
business for good movement, not all of whom would meet that type definition, but certainly of who uh, are increasingly wearing their their values on their sleeve and looking to be more environmentally sustainable, support more causes. People like the B Corps, which is a third party certification, a bit broader, more around volunteering, supplier diversity, philanthropy and so on, but certainly represents companies that are trying to kind of leverage their business to, to do a variety of good and a part of this broader business for good movement. And so however you define it, everyone agrees that it's growing. So what I want to ask quickly is why is that? And I think it represents a pretty big cultural shift that I call the shift from legacy to alignment. And so some way legacy is the domain of philanthropy. It's about giving back later. You know, it's about after you've reached some certain threshold of personal wealth and satisfaction, you then often look to opportunities to give back. Whereas alignment is about the day to day. And that's really the world of social enterprise where we can offer people the chance to align their daily activities, who they work for, who they buy from with the values, the kind of impacts they want to see. And so, you know, philanthropy, this give back model often leads to very strange outcomes. This is Alfred Nobel, who's, you know, we think of today, you know, he, we, it's his face that we put on a coin and give to the world's greatest change makers, but he made his money as the inventor of dynamite and was probably the single person most responsible for the carnage of the First World War, which is why he wanted to change his legacy by endowing a peace prize. And so, you know, it throws up all these kind of cognitive dissonance in philanthropy um, because there's a real separation between how the money was made and then how it is spent later on, often. And whereas social enterprise is about bringing those things together. And we're seeing increasing demand from younger generations that they want these things brought together. They want to be able to purchase from companies that support care, uh, uh, causes they care about. They want to be able to work for brands. And this pressure on brands from graduating from younger people and graduates is in fact one of the great drivers of change within corporations today. We kind of thought it would be it's less so consumers and more so staff in, in many cases for those who compete for, you know, talented, highly quality, uh, qualified graduates. They are placing higher expectations on the businesses they choose to join because they're putting in some ways different expectations on themselves, not just to give back later, but to think about these things now. And this is a really important shift as I said, in the whole conception of the role of business in a society, a shift from this traditional um, view as, as you know, expressed by Milton Freeman that we call the shareholder view, that essentially everything a business does should be in the, the service of shareholders, provided it stays within the rule of the game. And guys, that's a trap because it turns out businesses are really good at influencing the rules of the game. Um, and so this idea of staying within the rules of the game doesn't mean as much when you have uh, unfair access to influencing what those rules are. Um, but the good news is that this is a survey of millennials um, in, in the US, only 7% of them still agree with that limited conception of the role of business. Fully 93% think that businesses have some other role to play in terms of doing social and environmental good. 21%, I would say, think they should be social enterprises. Think they should be kind of rebuilt around a social or environmental impact model. And then the second shift that I'll just touch on very quickly, that's a shift, I think, in how we think about our values and how we think about our role as change makers. And then simultaneous with that, there's been a shift in how we talk about our values, how we share ideas as a society that I call the shift from interruption to interaction. And you see this in marketing. I did, you know, it's a, a little while since I finished my uni degree, over 20 years. I did a couple of marketing classes while I was doing my political science degree. And they used to say, word of mouth is the best marketing, but it doesn't scale. And so while people saw it as the best quality of marketing, it never had the quantity. You know, you couldn't get to scale. And so what you had to do was interrupt people at scale. And so how ideas spread kind of marketing point of view, they pay to interrupt people. People are watching the footy, you pay to put an ad. People are even, same on philanthropy. People are walking to the shops, you pay someone in a koala costume to interrupt them and ask for a donation or direct mail. All of this is forms of interruption. Whereas today, the best marketing isn't the marketing that we interrupt people with. It's the marketing they choose to do for us by sharing what we're doing with others peer to peer. And so today for the first time, or very recently for the first time, that peer-to-peer -peer sharing is not only the highest quality of, of idea sharing, but the highest quantity as well. And that's a world that benefits a very different set of companies. A world of interruption is a world where you need budget. It costs money to interrupt. And so it favored the status quo. But a world of interaction is a world that, that benefits stories that are worth sharing, that create influence, that are trusted, timely, and memorable. And this is a world where social enterprises have an intrinsic advantage, intrinsic advantage. And you can see this in some ways with the most boring products. Toilet paper purchasers don't often share their purchases on Instagram unless they buy from who gives a crap, in which case they, they do. Why is that? It's because every photo literally says more. It doesn't just say, I buy toilet paper. It says, I'm a conscious consumer. I care about others. There's literally more content 
in each of these photos. Why is that? Because the business means more and therefore purchasing from them means more as well. And so really, you know, why does this matter in a galactic sense? Not just why is this happening, but why does it matter? It matters because we have a lot of work to do. You know, we're, uh, we're approaching, you know, the 2030 deadline. Right now, we're on course with only 12% of the indicators when you get underneath this. And fundamentally, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm, a, I, I'm from the not-for-profit sector. I'm not a, a, you know, so you meet some people who are kind of a little bit zealous around like businesses are a more legitimate vehicle than non-profits. I don't believe that at all. I think we just need to do, I think we need to use all the tools in the toolkit if we're going to achieve these goals. And I think there has to be a huge role for business, but business represents the majority of all the resources that swash, that, that swash around our society. Um, business has a set of tools that are incredibly powerful for unearthing and and delivering value and for scaling what works. They've done a lot of harm as well. We need to reorient those tools. We need to use them purposefully. But ultimately, you know, when you look at these goals, they are also enormous business opportunities. It's not going to be, you know, when we talk about building sustainable cities and communities, it's not going to be nonprofits and governments building all those sustainable cities. It's going to be businesses. When we talk about decent work, it's not going to be nonprofits and governments employing everyone. It's going to be businesses creating decent work and employing people. Um, we talk about zero hunger. It's not just going to, it's not going to be nonprofits and businesses making all the food. It's going to be businesses that need to make food in a way that is sustainable and also supports life on land, life under the water, et cetera, as well. So these are, so we live at a time, we live at a moment where the greatest social and environmental challenges on earth are also the greatest business opportunities on earth. And social enterprise is a way of pursuing those opportunities, which is why we spent 10 years helping people raise money. But a couple of years ago, we launched our course to help people build social enterprises and design social enterprises because we think it's such an exciting new vehicle for delivering change. But often you get people with a strong background in business, but who are fairly unsophisticated about how change happens or people who are really experts in change and impact from the nonprofit sector that need to learn some basics around business. Uh, and it's teaching each other, each other's tool sets, you know, how to think about impact and theories of change, but also business models, uh, you know, service design and so on. And we think there's a real magic in the combination of these tool sets, not preferencing one over another but seeing the value in applying both of them to these enormous opportunities and, 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 um, and, and challenges. So at the end of the day, you know, I think what's really exciting and inspiring for me and what drives me with the work I do is not just that we can use business to create the future that we want, but I think we must use business to create the future we want, which is why I think social enterprise has such an important role to play. Thanks for having me.